Many times when John Lee is talking about meditation, he compares it to skills, manual skills. This is keeping with the canon as well. The Buddha also uses analogies with skills. This is like being a good meditator is like being a good cook, a good carpenter, a good archer. A good cook knows how to read his boss, what kind of food the boss likes, doesn't like. The boss doesn't have to say, but the cook notices what kind of food he reaches for, what kind of food he eats a lot of. You make more of that. Well, the John Lee expands on that image by saying that you don't fix the same thing every day. If it's porridge today, porridge tomorrow, porridge the next day, even if you make a really good porridge, your boss is going to try to find a new cook. So you learn how to vary your offerings. So as you're sitting here meditating, focusing on the breath, notice what kind of breathing you like. And the breathing you like right now may not be the breathing you're going to like in five minutes. So keep on top of it. Another image the Buddha gives is of an archer who's able to shoot long distances, fire shots in rapid succession, pierce great masses. It takes strength to be an archer back in those days. They had these enormous bows. You had to be really strong in order to pull it back. As you shoot great distances, you see that what you're experiencing now, in terms of the aggregates, is going to apply to whatever aggregates you experienced in the past and will experience in the future. You take that to heart. Fire shots in rapid succession, you see where the mind is suffering and where it's causing itself suffering. In other words, you actually see the act of clinging, the act of craving, and how they're connected. And then to pierce great masses is to pierce the mass of ignorance, avijja. It's interesting that the Buddha and the John Lee use these images of skills. Because the word avijja is the opposite of vijja in Pali, and vijja means not only knowledge but also skill. This is the reason why we suffer. We have lack of skill in how we handle our minds. And so as we meditate, we're trying to learn how to be more skillful. We don't just sit back and watch things pass. When the Buddha talks about having penetrative knowledge of arising and passing away, make sure you notice the word penetrative. You're not just looking at things coming and going. But penetrative means that you understand where they're coming from, where they're going, and what's more skillful and what's less skillful. Then you use that ability to see these things to perfect your concentration and to perfect your discernment. Because we're engaged in what the Buddha calls directed thought and evaluation right here. You direct your thoughts to the breath, and then you evaluate it and you watch it. And as John Lee notices, the more refined your evaluation, the better the results are going to be. Try to be really sensitive to how the breath feels. He says it's like sifting flour or sifting sand that you're going to use to make clay tiles. If your sifter is coarse, you're going to get coarse sand. And the tiles are going to have low quality. But if you have a fine sifter, then you get better sand, better tiles. In the beginning, you just make ordinary flat tiles. And then you start changing the shape. And then you start changing the composition of the clay and the sand. And you find that you can make more and more interesting things out of the clay. And how do you do that? It's through your ingenuity. When the Buddha talks about how you reflect on yourself, as you meditate, it says you reflect on your conviction, you reflect on your generosity, your virtue, your discernment, your learning about the Dharma, 
and your ingenuity. You have to learn how to think outside the box a bit. It's the craftsmen who think outside the box who move the craft forward. In this case, you're trying to move the craft of your mind forward. So notice what's good about the breath right now. Try to nurture the good parts of the breath in the body. And then ask yourself, is the breath too long, is it too short, too fast, too slow? What would be better? And you use your imagination. Some people object to that idea. They say we should just be sitting with what really is. Well, the fact that the mind is shaping experience, its experience already, that's what really is. If you want to be sensitive to how it's shaping its experience, you change the way you shape it. And sometimes you need an act of imagination to open your mind to possibilities of what's actually happening. It's like learning to imagine that the world is round. It takes an active act of the imagination. Because you look around and everything looks like a disk with a sphere of the sky over it. And the idea that the world is round, you wonder, well, what about the people on the other side? Don't they fall off? That's when you have to start thinking about gravity. And as you allow your imagination to think about these things, it opens up the possibility, well, maybe that's the way it actually is. So when you're using imagination, using your ingenuity with the breath, yes, you are creating an image in the mind, but then you're testing it right away. Does this help? Does this way of perceiving the breath help? How about perceiving it? coming in from the front, can perceive it coming in from the back. What difference does that make? Because sometimes as we pull the breath in, we create a lot of tension in the back of the neck and in the shoulders. So how about thinking about the breath coming in through the back of the neck and the shoulders? What does that do? So as John Lee says, you. You learn from the object that you're working with. If you're working with clay, you learn from the clay. If you're working with the breath, you learn from the breath, because the mind is going to be reflected in the breath. And you get a better and better sense of what works and what doesn't work. This is how discernment develops. Remember the Buddha's first question for discernment is a dualistic question. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and pain? You're trying to see these distinctions. And when the Buddha sets forth his answers to that question, basically they come down to two of what he calls categorical truths. And it's interesting, they're the only teachings in the canon that he calls categorical. This is one of the advantages of having a, a CD-ROM with a canon, because you can check how many times is a word used, where is it used, where is it not used. You learn a lot of interesting things that way. Type in the word categorical. There's one teaching that's categorical, which is that you abandon unskillful bodily conduct, unskillful verbal conduct, unskillful mental conduct, and then you develop skillful bodily, verbal, mental conduct. It's really basic, but it gets you thinking in terms of skill. Unskillful conduct in the body would be killing, stealing, illicit sex. Unskillful verbal conduct would be lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter. Unskillful mental conduct is inordinate greed, ill will, and having wrong views. Those are things you avoid, you abandon, if you find that they actually exist in you. Then you try to develop their opposites. And you have to approach them as skills. 
Learning how not to lie at all is a real skill. One, because it's so easy to just say what you think is going to get people satisfied so they don't ask too many more questions, or just to please somebody. But the Buddha says, no, no lying, period. That means if there's some information you don't want to give and you are sure that it's a skillful motivation for not giving it, how do you avoid giving the information? That's where your ingenuity has to come in. So even these basic principles of action teach you a lot. And it gets you ready for the other categorical teaching, which is the Four Noble Truths. Now these tr truths, too, don't just sit there. They have their duties associated with them. The first truth is the fact that stress is in clinging to the aggregates, and you want to comprehend that. In other words, see it actually happening, understand how it's happening. That leads you to the second noble truth, which is what's causing it. Well, the craving of three kinds. Craving for sensuality, for becoming, non-becoming. Then there's the fact that that craving can be ended, and when you end the craving, that's the end of suffering. That's something you want to realize, actually, to see it happening. And you do that by developing the path, which basically comes down to virtue, concentration, discernment. So the Buddha's categorical truths are, one, dualistic, because the choices you make really do make a difference. Suffering and not suffering really are different. Following your cravings and abandoning your cravings, those really are different, and they make important differences. So they're dualistic, and also they have these inherent duties. They're not truths that just sit there on the page. But they ask you to look at your own behavior and see what you can change in your behavior. Because the reason you're suffering, of course, is from something you're doing. But you can do other things that would put an end to the suffering, that would actually get through that lack of skill, overcome that lack of skill. So the Buddha's truths are active. And they ask you to focus on areas of life where you really can make a difference. And it comes basically down to the fact you've been unskillful in the way you run your mind. You don't know what's going on clearly. And often you will misuse some of the skills or some of the powers that the mind has. Because the mind is very powerful. It shapes your life. The fact that you're engaged in the world depends on the mind. You're not sitting, simply sitting here on the receiving end of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, or ideas. The mind actively goes out and shapes these things. There are potentials coming in through the senses that come from your past actions. Because your actual experience is something you're shaping right now, and you don't see that, which is why you suffer, because you're doing it with lack of skill. But if you can see this happening, you can be more skillful, and what you do actually turns into a path to the end of suffering. So these are the skills we're working on. Kind of laid out in the Buddhist categorical teachings. They all come down to the principle that there are good causes and bad causes. The good causes give rise to good effects. The bad causes give rise to bad effects. Very basic idea. It's so basic that people tend to overlook it, and they want something more sophisticated, something more advanced. Years back, I was asked to give a talk to a group of people on the Four Noble Truths. 
The talk was arranged by a Tibetan group. And then the leader of the group s sat down beside me after I'd finished the talk and turned to the audience and said, well, yeah, that was a dualistic interpretation of the Dharma. We get to the really good stuff later when we get to the non-dualistic. And that's the problem. Everybody wants to rush to the end without getting the basics down. And in some cases, at the end, even though nirvana is not a dualism, it certainly is not the same thing as samsara. Samsara is a process by which we create suffering again and again and again. We can't keep on going, going, going creating new worlds and then moving into them and causing suffering for ourselves, suffering for others. Nibbana is the ending of that process. Those are two very different things. So what it comes down to is that we can either be skillful or unskillful, and if we develop the proper skills, learning from our actions, using our ingenuity, learning from the clay or the silver or the vines we use to weave baskets, whatever our skill. We see that we really, really can make a difference. And that's the whole reason the Buddha taught. He's making a difference. The world without the Dharma and the world with the Dharma are two very different things. We're lucky we have the Dharma available so that we can make a good difference, too. <laughs>